Hey church, would you help me to say a big hello to our Bell Chase campus? Come on, put your hands together for them. Welcome to church, everybody. We're so, so glad that you're here today, and hopefully, hopefully you're enjoying the day so far. I know it's a little chilly out, but you know, we started the campus last weekend with our grand opening, and uh, it's beginning the new year together. It's pretty exciting. I have one really important thing to tell you, is that last weekend, we had 24 people make decisions to follow Jesus Christ. Come on, let's honor those decisions. If you're one of those who prayed that prayer, we want to help you to go beyond the prayer. We want to help you to grow in your faith. And so we want to encourage you to kind of settle in and make church a priority and find a small group that, that is going to launch next weekend. Find a place to go further than your prayer. Start putting one foot in front of the other. And by the way, uh, today we're actually starting a brand new curriculum. Got a brand new Next Steps book today, 5 p.m. right here in this room and at Bell Chase. If you're looking for like, hey, what's my next step? Where are we going? What are we doing? We've re-recorded that message from me. Our team's going to be there. It's, it's all new material to help you grow. And let me just say, for some of y'all been around for a while, you might need a refresher, all right? And so if you're looking for what's next for you today, anyone can come. Don't have to sign up. Just show up. And as always, child care is provided as well. And so maybe you just need a break, okay? And I'll bring your little ones and I'll go a little di bit deeper with God. One other thing I want to say as we're beginning today, and that is we begin every year asking every single person who attends our church to fill out one of those connection cards that's in the seat back in front of you. The connection card does what it says. It connects you to the church, but we always give you the hassle-free guarantee. So if you're new to the environment, I'm not showing up at your house. We're not bugging you. I'm going to send you one letter just says, hey, welcome to the church. Here's some next steps for you. The reason I'm asking every single one of you, even if you've been coming for years on years, is because we want to make sure that we can pastor you well. And in January, we use it kind of as a pastoral care update card. We want to make sure that if you went through something that we're calling the right number, sending the right email, we want to make sure that we can care for you well. And so you just fill out the card, and as you go today, drop it in the buckets, and we would love to kind of step in if you've got any questions or comments. Uh, my favorite comment this week was from one of the... Uh, young ladies from our kids church she was in one of our adult services and she just wrote on the back i love this church i love those comments okay by the way and so I, I love that we have an environment that's generational and fun and where young people feel like they can let us know what's going on and so there's a lot you can do there if you got it say i got it all right, you want to make sure that you're awake today. It's a little cold. We're feeling a little lethargic. Some of you are like really had a hard week because you had to like stay home with your children for multiple days. I, I understand you're like, summer's over. What are they doing here? Okay, it's been that kind of week today. I want to encourage you to lean in as we're in week two of our Big Rocks series. And here's what we said last week as we kicked off the series. We said we all have enemies and we all have obstacles to our health and our success. And just like King David in the Old Testament defeated Goliath, there are some big rocks that we need to smooth out. We need to make sure that they're a part of our lives. And we need to make sure that they're smooth enough that we can use them in a way that's honoring to God. Our key passage, it'll be on every screen. 1 Samuel chapter 17, here's what it says. It says, so David picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. As Goliath moved closer to attack, I love David's tenacity, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and he hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone was thrown so hard that it sunk in, it sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. Here's what I'm believing for you as we begin 2024, that you're going to pick up some big rocks, you're going to smooth them out, and then when the enemy puts an obstacle in your way, something that's keeping you from health and success, you're going to have a big rock to say, no, 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 I can defeat you, I can win. And week one of this series, last week, we talked about how busyness is really robbing us from spiritual growth. We're running after all sorts of things. We're getting lost in the minutia of information, and we're not really transforming and growing into the people that God wanted us to be. And I believe, here's what I believe with all my heart, this will be the best year of your life physically. 
If it's the best year of your life spiritually, if you will choose to kind of step back and say, no, no, big rock number one, I'm going to make sure that I'm not so busy that I miss God. Now, I'm going a little bit deeper today, and it, it may feel like the deep end of the pool for some of you guys, but in week two of this series, I want to talk to you about overcoming discontentment. Because discontentment is an obstacle to an orderly life. As we begin the new year, I think most of us are like, I'd like this to work, and I'd like that to work, and I'd like to, I'd like to make budget for once in my life. Anybody here have written a financial budget that you've missed every single month last year? You spent more than you were supposed to. And, and so you've got like, I want to order some things. I, I want everything to go in this direction. Am I the only one? Am I the only one? No, no. We all start January. We're going this way. But we start chasing squirrels. That's what happens. We start running for this. We start running for that. We get distracted by this. Someone calls and disrupts what you should be doing and we start running after other things, and we do it primarily because of the emptiness or the discontentment in our own souls. We all feel discontent at times, and when we do, we typically run to the worst things to fill our lives. What does a discontent life look like? Well, it can look like an employee working ridiculous hours to make one more sale or to make everybody happy. It can also look like a parent living vicariously through their child's sports career. Anybody know somebody like that, right? You show up for, a, it's like six and seven year old uh, baseball and they're like, you know, you're, you're barely lobbing the ball to them and the kid hits a, uh, an infield home run because none of the kids can find, the, anybody, any parent, none of, the, none of the kids can pick up the ball and make it there. And then there's one parent walking away, it's like, we're right, my kid got a home run. I'm like, you got issues is what you got. Right? There are these people who are so discontent about their childhood and life that they're trying to find fulfillment through everything else. Discontentment is real and plagues us all, and it really is an enemy to an orderly life. Because in your discontentment, you run for things that won't help you. Let's define the word discontentment, if you would, write it down with me. It is a restless desire or a craving for something one does not have. There's some sort of feeling of emptiness, and you feel discontent because what you're craving you don't have in your life. If we aren't careful, when we feel discontent, we end up chasing the wrong things. And three of the most common things we run to when we feel discontent, write them down with me, is food money and love. Can you say those three words with me? Come on. Food, money, and love. And depending on whichever one is your big deal, when you feel discontent, that's the thing you run to. That's the thing that you're like, if only I could get that, I would feel better. This is going to be one of those days where you're going to feel like, should I say amen right now? And you ought to do it just for your own soul, okay? Just to go with it. If food, money, and love are such a big deal, and they are a big deal, and especially in our nation, because every bit of advertisement right now, you know what it's about? It's about food, it's about money, and it's about love. We've got like 4,000 different online dating and, you know, apps and ideas. I found one that's like farmersonly.com. I'm like, come on. Like, have we really got down that we need to say only farmers? Are you only willing to marry a farmer? Because love is that important. And, and then money is everything. It's like everyone's advertising, everyone's monetized. They're influencing because I might make a few cents if you buy it through my link in the bio. You know, like that's where we are. And then food, for heaven's sakes, food commercials are killing me during the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Can I just confess to you guys, Olive Garden has never looked so good in my life. I'm like, I'm eating breadsticks after this. But you know, the commercial, they look juicy. They look like they've got the right amount of butter on top. Come on, some of y'all say stop right now. And then you get there, and it's not, it's not bread. It's like a drumstick, you know? Like, it's, it's false advertisement. But since food, money, and love are the things that we most often run to, to fill our discontentment, I want to give you three truths. Write them down with me. Here's the first, and that is that food won't fill your soul. 
it will fill your belly and it will give you a temporary ease in that discontentment. But the, the, the very next thing that's going to happen, it's like the sugar high that doesn't last. It just doesn't fill the emptiness. And so though your belly might be full, your soul is still empty. And so you end up going over and over. Here's what a buddy of mine said. You get banned from the buffet if you're trying to fill your soul. <laughs> That's funnier than y'all laughed at. It's okay. But, uh, but because you're looking for something that you're going to take in that's going to make you feel okay. Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and 7 says, Everyone's toil is for their mouth. Yet their appetite is, come on, read with me, is never satisfied. Listen, listen, you're never going to find the fulfillment you want by eating something. Food is meant to be fuel to help you do what God's called you to do. It's not supposed to be happiness. And here in South Louisiana, boy, I tell you what, the devil's doing a good job, right? Uh, he's doing a good job of trying to keep us. Uh, <laughs> he's trying to keep us chasing the wrong thing. Food won't fill your soul. And this is why we take time each year to fast, because fasting quiets your physical appetites. And it opens and amplifies your spiritual life. Just saying no to something that you always go to and going to God instead, instead it quiets that as the answer and it amplifies God. Why should you fast? You shouldn't fast because you want to lose weight, though that may be a byproduct. You should fast to quiet the appetites that you've been running to to fill your soul. Hey, it's not too late. This is you know, the, the last of seven days of prayer and fasting. You could decide today, hey, I'm giving up social media. Hey, I'm giving up sweets. Hey, I'm giving up something that you've been running to instead of God. The second thing that I would say to you is that if food won't fill your soul, write it down with me this way, money won't make you matter in life. Everyone thinks if I just had a little bit more, then I would finally matter. People would notice me. I would be important. And have you noticed that as you get older, the number just keeps getting higher? Like when I was graduating college, I was like, this is a good job. I'm going to make a great living. I'm going to feed my family. That number has largely doubled. And then every time I write a budget for that, I'm like, how am I going to pay for these kids, right? I looked at my son the other day. I, I was talking to both of my children. They were, my, he's like, you know, when I, when I turn 18, I'll get to make these decisions. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, when you pay for yourself, you can make these. I'm trying to help some parents out in the room. I said, if you're still on the payroll, you're going to say, yes, sir, is what you're going to say. I don't care how old you are. Can I get a better amen? <laughs> I'm just saying, like, <laughs> that there's a whole lot more there I won't say today. Anyway. But uh, if you notice, like, there, everything is kind of built around this idea that, that, that if you just had a little bit more, you would matter. It would fill that hole. Some of you know that I, I kind of enjoy as a hobby, and I've gone back to something that I did as a child. I, I like to ride motorcycles a little bit, and uh, I, I recently saw this Instagram deal where it says, money can't buy you happiness, but it can buy you a motorcycle, and a motorcycle can make you happy. So just insert your motorcycle, okay? Just insert your thing that's there. But that's the lie. The lie is that if I just get more, then I can, I'll finally feel like I've arrived, and it just never ends. Food won't fill your soul. Money won't make you matter. 1 Timothy 6 says, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into, say it with me, into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, not money, let me say it again. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from their faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Chasing after this to fill the discontentment in your soul is not going to make you feel happy, healthy, and whole. That's why discontentment really is, it feels like it's an enemy or an obstacle you have to learn to overcome. Now, we talked about food. We talked about money. The third is in regards to love. And I use the word love because today's message is PG. But love, write it down with me this way, love won't alleviate your loneliness. 
I remember when I was a teenager and I'd seen all these pictures of people who were dating and love and, and, and I thought I even knew what love was. And you're running after this ideal of it and you think that once again, once again, if I get this in my life, if she would date me, if she would marry me, if I would, then everything would be okay. What you'll discover is that you still have many of the same struggles after you get married. There are just two of you struggling together. And sometimes that makes you better. Sometimes it's two of you spiraling in the wrong direction. Preaching better than y'all are amen and Christian right now. Some of y'all keep your elbows tucked in right now if you're sitting next to your spouse, you know. Right over left, don't touch anybody, right? The reality is that we have this mindset that love will fix our problems, or I'll say it to you plainly, that sex will be the answer. I'll finally have that, and that will make all of the difference in my life, but I've been living for just long enough to know that, that food won't do it, money won't do it, and love's not going to do it either. Listen to 1 John chapter 2. It says, don't, don't love the world's ways. And I love how the message translation says this, don't love the world's goods, all right? Everywhere you look, the world's goods are on some sort of billboard, or some sort of device for you to see. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes in goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. The world in all its, come on, say the next three words, in all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. John says, if you will get out of finding happiness in the chasing of other things, that you discover that if you bring your heart to God, you'll be set for eternity. That the discontentment and the emptiness inside of you will be filled by God. One of my professors in college just said it simply like this, that all of mankind has been brought into the world with a God-shaped hole in their soul. And you may try to put other things there, but they won't fit or they won't fill. They won't fit or they won't fill the emptiness in your life. But if you will go to God, John says you'll be set for eternity. That you'll find a happiness and a peace in your soul that answers the deep desires of your life. We all want to fill the discontentment in our lives. It's normal to want to do that. But food, money, and love can't do it on their own. They can't fill your life the way you think it will fill your life. And so, depending on which one you go to, you may say, man, food really messed with me. Pastor, can't believe you brought it up. It's probably it messed with you because that's your go-to. And if I started talking about money, you're kind of like, I don't want to hear this. There's a little bit of like a reflex away. It's probably because money is too important. What I discovered at a young age is that food, food and money weren't my big deals. It was, I was all about love. I tell you, I had these grand ideas about love. Come on, anybody remember boys to men back in the day? Come on, I'll make love to you like you want me to. Come on, can I sing the rest of the song? I'm not going to do it, all right? Some of y'all mamas are like, don't do that right now. But you know, then you, you start with that song and then you go, although we... We end up, right, although we come to the end of the road, right? <laughs> Starts with, I'll make love to you, and then we at the end of the road, girl, okay? It's not working out. What I discovered is as I went after someone instead of God, that I found this constant emptiness in my life. You fast forward to me going to ministry college and starting as a youth pastor and deciding that I'm going to stop the whole dating game. I'm going to stop pursuing. I'm just going to wait for God to answer my prayer and then insert this beautiful lady on the front row over here. She walks into my dad's church for the first time, and, and we were a small church, and when she walked in, I'm like, I could marry her, okay? Like, we, we could do this. Now, she had not agreed to even go on a date, but I, I had plans. I even prayed about it. The Lord told me. She was like, that's nice. 
It took three times for me to convince her to finally go out with me. And after the first time, I got so mad. I was like, have you seen me? I'm just making y'all laughing too hard right now. It's not fair. It's not fair. I'm just trying to help y'all. So I went to God. It's like, what is the deal? I think she's the right one. What's the deal? You're not ready for her. I didn't like that answer. So I tried to do it again in my own strength. Said, listen, one day you're going you're gonna to marry somebody. I'm not going anywhere to you. You marry me or somebody else. Some people might call that stalking. I don't think it is. There was no weirdness. I just said, I'm all in. And she said, no. Now, the moral of the story for some of you who've been turned down a few times is when you see a good thing, you just got to keep on going. Can I get a good amen, right? Because, come on The second time I went to God in prayer, and here's what I, look, it was so real to me. I felt like the Lord spoke to me, she's too important to you. I said, you will elevate her and think that she's going to fill the emptiness in your life. And until you realize that that emptiness isn't filled by food, money, or love, you're going to continually find yourself unhappy and broken and empty. And God began to do a work in me. Begin to change me. Come on, everybody, third time's a charm, right? I went back, I said, listen, God's done a work in me. (laughs) I'm just kidding. We've been married over 25 years now, and it's not always been perfect. It's not always been easy. But what we discovered in the beginning is that God is the answer to the emptiness and the discontent. At one point, as trying to share this, you know, kind of like trying to make it real clear, and I was like, I want to help her to understand. And so I walked in one day, and I looked at her and said, I said, Amber, I just want you to know you don't make me happy. <laughs> y'all, all of y'all, if you don't know the next line, you're cringing right now. Like, why would you ever say that? But I said to you, I said to her, I said, you make me happier. Because I've discovered that my happiness comes from God. And if I'm looking to food, money, or love to be God, then it's never going to fill the empty places of my life. Listen, I'm not always good at this. And there's still some days that I wake up feeling empty and I find myself looking to the wrong things. But after trying the wrong thing again and finding emptiness again, I'm reminded that God is the one. God is the source. God is the answer. His ways are perfect. His words are true. And when you go to him first, He allows all the other things to be icing on the cake of your life. He allows all the other things so then you can know what to do with food and you can enjoy. Come on, South Louisiana, king cakes and gumbo, everybody. You can enjoy life and love and happiness because you founded your life and your contentment on God. The Apostle Paul, here's what he says in 1 Corinthians in regards to this subject matter. He says, I don't want you to forget, One Hope Church, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and and all of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was, come on, say with me, that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered, scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us. Would you read it? Every voice in the room, come on, Bell Chase, do it with me, so that we would not crave evil things as they did. You and I are born with a nature to crave wrong things. We have a God-shaped hole, and if you try to put the wrong things in, it is never going to fill what God can fill. As we get, begin 2024, if you want to grow in your spiritual life, you're going to have to answer the question of discontentment and where do you find fulfillment? We can't keep going through the motions, going to church three, four, five times a year, checking the box, thinking I've got my fire insurance, I'm going to go to heaven, but the emptiness is still going to be filled by the food, the money, or the love. 
Today, here's my challenge to you. Recognize that the obstacle to your health and your success is that you've been running to other things rather than God. And I'm inviting you in this season to run to God. Let me give you one spiritual thing and two practical things to overcome discontentment. Would you take some notes? Write it down with me. Here's the first thing. Here's the spiritual thing. Go to God to fill up daily. Go to God first. Do you realize that daily emptiness is by design? Let me say it to you again. Your daily emptiness is by design. Because God did not want you to pray a prayer 30 years ago and think you have a relationship with him. The emptiness that you wake up with is kind of like your physical life is a picture of your spiritual life. How many of y'all ate a good meal last night? Come on, raise a hand at me. Come on. Some of y'all ate a good meal. Seven of y'all are honest. All of y'all ate. I can tell. I'm looking at you. You ate. You ate yesterday. We all, that wasn't an insult. Don't do that. I just, you look healthy and beautiful, okay? All of us had a meal yesterday. How many of y'all woke up this morning hungry? Come on, wave something at me. You woke up hungry, right? You wanted that caffeine fix. You wanted, you had a need for something. There is a physical picture of a, your spiritual life. Same thing happens. Did you eat with God yesterday? Did you go to God yesterday? And if you didn't, you're living on a spiritual fast and wondering why you feel so empty on the inside. Some of you are going Sunday to Sunday. Some of you are going once a month trying to find something on an Instagram reel that's going to finally speak to your soul. Today, here's what I'm saying to you. Go to God. Go to God. Just make the daily habit. Just start with five minutes. I'm going to read a verse, and I'm going to submit my life to God. It sounds so easy, but how often do we skip it because of something else showed up? Jesus prayed, Matthew chapter 6, give us this day our daily bread. Why? Because you need to eat daily. Listen, some of you say, well, pastor, you know, like this, you're preaching to the choir right now. Pastor, I've, I've heard this so many times. How many meals did you skip in 2023? How many days did you miss with God? How many days did you go to something else? I don't want to know. Take a little bit of an audit of your life and say, I spent three months angry and unhappy, and then I discovered that God could fix that. Today, I'm, I know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I told you we were going deeper today, right? Some of y'all said, Pastor, I want to go deeper. Here it is. You need to go to God. Listen to how the psalmist described his relationship with God. He said, Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with matters too great or too awesome for me to grasp. Instead, I have calmed and quieted myself. Like a weaned child who no longer cries for its mother's milk. Yes, like a weaned child is my soul within me. The psalmist is saying there's a place with God where you look at what everyone else is chasing and saying, oh, I don't need that as much as I used to need it. Matter of fact, I don't want it. Because I've come to realize that God answers the discontentment in my soul. And I know that if I go to God first, he'll give me all the other things. Listen to the words of Jesus. Matthew 6 and 31. Don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of who? Unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. So... Seek first, right? Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Go to God and then the food and the money and the love are icing on the cake of your life that you can enjoy, but you're not expecting them to give you sustenance. When you fill up in a healthy way, then you're able then to pursue all of the other things that God has placed in your heart and life. Remember I said the first is really spiritual. Go to God. Here's the second. Let's be real practical. Number two, write it down. Then you would create a goal week schedule. 
Remember I said it earlier, I don't go to God telling him what to do. I ask God what I should do. Tell me what you want me to do. When you find your, your uh, contentment in God, then you can hear what God wants you to do. And then instead of writing a to-do list for your life based upon trying to fill your emptiness, you're actually going after what God wants for you. So then you begin to build your life and your schedule, because ultimately your schedule is your to-do list. You know that? Some of you have got like, we've gotten so electronic to these days. Got a paper to-do list. I got an electronic to-do list. You, you want to know what your real to-do list is? Your calendar. Take an audit of the last seven days or the last month. What have you actually done? And what I'm saying to you is if you go to God first, he will lead you. Then you can begin to write a goal list for your life. And you can stand on the contentment of God while you're still dreaming for what God wants you to dream for. Let me give it to you in verse. First Timothy 6, 6 says, But godliness actually is a means of, say it with me, is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. So when you're godly and content, he says, I can give you all the other stuff. I can fill your life with all of your dream list, your goal list, your want list, all the things you like. One day I'm going to have a car like that. One day I'm going to have a house like that. One day I'm going to be rich like my mom and dad. And you grow up and realize that they were not rich ever, right? <laughs> they were just doing a good job of helping you make it, right? Paul says, Paul says, godliness and contentment is a means of accomplishing the dreams and goals that I have for you. So now for almost 20 years, my pastor as a mentor helped me to organize my life, go to God first, but then begin to build a schedule that's reflective of where God wants you to be. Want to grow spiritually? Make time for God every day. Make time for a small group. Make time to go to church. Take next steps in your faith. Find somewhere to serve and make a difference with your life. You want to grow? Do the things that God says will grow you. And put them on your schedule. Plan your life and work the plan. Now, for many years, I've been measuring some areas of my life. And I'm going to give you 10 areas that my pastor has mentored me for many years and said, you should check the list. I'm going to put them on screen right now. Here's 10 areas of growth. If you want to grow, I want you to take a quick screenshot of this list real quick, grab it, and ask God, which one of these should be my goal for 2024? Which one should I build a schedule for? Which one should I make sure that every week I am focusing on to grow in that area? I'm challenging you to create a goal week schedule based upon the contentment of God in your life. If you want to dive a little bit deeper, you can break it down however you want. But here's what I would say to you. Take your seven-day week and break it into 21 increments of time. You've got a morning, you've got an afternoon, you've got an evening. Why don't you give one goal to your morning, one goal to your afternoon, one goal to your evening. And I would challenge you, you parents who have families, to make one of yours for family every single day. If I work late night, I try to stick around in the morning to have breakfast with the kids and to spend a little bit more time with them because I'm making sure that my family gets one of the morning, the afternoon, or the evening because when I, when I grow older, I don't want to have given up my family for you or for anybody else. Matter of fact, my first ministry isn't you. My first ministry is at home. Amen, everybody? I know it sounds super like, that's so, so practical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to God, find contentment. God, what should I do? Create a goal week schedule. Break it down. And then here's our last as we begin to close today. The third and probably the most important one is that we should give thanks for what God has already given us. Let me say it to you this way. Gratitude, gratitude really is the secret weapon against discontentment. Every time I begin to act as though God didn't show up for me or that didn't happen the way I want, when I go to God in prayer, he begins to show me all the things that he has answered to remind me that if he answered those, he'll answer these. And I want to encourage some of you to maybe create a gratitude list in this season of your life to, to decide to lean into God and ask God to, to show you what he's already done. 
Here's what Philippians chapter 4 and 12 says. He says, I know what it is to be in need, the Apostle Paul says. And I know what it is to have plenty. But I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Come on, read it with me. I can do this through him who gives me strength. All this through him who gives me strength. I like how the King James always makes me, gets me confused. King James says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. The modern versions always make me mess up the words. <laughs> Simple message today. But can I say it to you? Probably the most life-changing message for 2024. The emptiness in your soul is only filled by God. Hey, everybody, the emptiness in your soul is only filled by God. And if you'll lean into him this year, it'll change everything. The secret to contentment is going to God in gratitude. The secret to contentment is going to God in gratitude. In every location, would you bow with me in prayer? Just for a moment of reflection and prayer. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today, and you say, Pastor, I know I've been chasing all the other things. And I feel as empty. I feel as empty as I've ever felt today. I want to invite you to go to God. I want to invite you to make him your Lord and your Savior. It's possible today that you find yourself far from him, but you used to be close to him. Today, I won't embarrass you. I won't ask you to stand or come to the front. But if you know you need God to answer the emptiness, would you whisper this prayer? Say these words right after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm giving you my life. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Would you forgive me for trying to live this life my own way? And God, would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life? In Jesus' name.